Good morning and welcome to this worship gathering. We so much appreciate you inviting us into your home for this time of worship. Uh, Rhonda and I and our family, we miss you guys so much and miss being together and worshiping together uh, in our sanctuary. But you know, worship isn't where you are. Worship is who it is that we praise and adore. And that's what we're here to do today. So I thank each and every one of you uh, for welcoming us. And I hope that your hearts and your minds are attuned and ready just to praise and worship and adore our Heavenly Father. And let's begin this time together, won't you, by joining me in prayer. Let's pray. Oh, gracious and wonderful Heavenly Father, we come this morning with hearts that are just open and ready and willing to receive all that it is that you have for us today. We praise you for the amazing and loving and all-powerful God that you are. We thank you, Lord, for your very presence with us in each and every home that is a part of this tuning in to worship today. And I ask God that not just with us that are a part of this worship gathering, but for those across this globe that love you and adore you, that we all lift our voices united together in praising and loving and worshiping you. Father, let the distractions go away. Let us just simply focus on who it is that we worship and to give our adoration to you. Lord, thank you for this time. We love you. We praise you, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, let's worship, friends.
there was a teenage couple in Louisiana. They had just come from their high school homecoming football game. And they left the game and got in the car and they went to this sort of local place, the lover's lane of their community there in Louisiana, if you will. While they were there, this young couple was approached by two men. One of the men actually stood back and watched. He, he in fact, held the boyfriend at gunpoint while the other young man raped the young teenage girl. Afterwards, the rapist brutally murdered the young girl and the young boy, the teenage couple, left their bodies in a ditch and ran off. As the story unfolded, eventually the young men were, were found, they were apprehended, they were tried and they were convicted. The one doing the watching received a sentence of life imprisonment. The other young man received the death sentence by lethal injection. You know, there's always sort of a lengthy waiting period from the time of sentencing until the time that the death execution is actually taken place. And during that waiting period, there was a woman by the name of Helen Prejean. She was a nun, Sister Helen, and she began to establish a relationship with this young man on death row. In fact, she became his spiritual advisor. She got to know him and she attempted to sort of dig deeply in her conversations with him to see and understand his heart and just to find some sense of, of goodness there. She very worked very hard, but unsuccessfully fought and pleaded to overturn the death sentence. Um, you can well imagine that her efforts to befriend this young man and to give him any sense of, of compassion or understanding in his life, she received quite a bit of criticism. From, from many in the, in the media and in the community, and especially from the two murder victims' families. Sister Helen Prejean tells her story of her interactions um, with this young man, how it is that they came to know one another right through to his, his ultimate execution and some of the things that, that occurred in the aftermath of his death. She tells her story in a book she wrote called Dead Man Walking. It was also made into a movie. And in, in both, you see her compassion for life, how she just values God's creation, even those who commit the most evil and heinous of acts, as this young man had done. She talks about uh, her love of life, despite the murderer's total lack of regard for life. And she also helps us see into the story of the two families that lost two very precious young people. A total gut-wrenching, senseless loss. Why? Why did that have to happen? It was so wrong. Those teenagers had the rest of their lives ahead of them. They were so innocent. And it was all just so, so unfair. You know, God gets the last word. He always has the last word. Last week, as we studied together, we talked about how God has the last word in our life discouragement. And today we're going to talk about how God has the last word in our unfairness. We're going to look in a story in the Old Testament about uh, two brothers. We begin there, Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau were twin boys. And we're told in the scripture that they struggled within their mother's wombs. In other words, they were at each other even before they came into the world. And the tradition of their culture in their day was that the oldest son, he had all the, the family rights. You know, he, he got everything. Uh, and technically, Esau was the first, the eldest to be born. Jacob came right behind him. But it was Esau that had all the family rights and blessings. 
the boys were, were growing up and it was obvious at a very early age, they were very, very different. They had different interests and different desires. They lived life very differently. Their parents, Isaac and Rebecca, played favorites with the boys. Isaac was quite fond of Esau, the outdoorsman. Rebecca really loved Jacob, the one who stood a little bit closer to home and, and cared more about things in the home and family. There was a time when Esau had been out in the fields and, and doing his work for the day, and he came into the house just absolutely famished, starving. His brother Jacob was preparing some sort of a, a stew that he had made, and Jacob was so hungry, he said, hey, give me something to eat, brother. And uh, Jacob said, fine, yeah, I'll give you something to eat. But in order to do so, you need to give me your birthright as the eldest, the firstborn. Well, in a moment of complete lack of judgment and weakness, Esau agreed to this strange request. And in fact, gave up his birthright for a bowl of stew. Later, there was a time when um, Isaac was getting older, his eyesight was failing, his health was failing. And Jacob, with the help and at the initiation of his mother, Rebecca, they actually tricked their, the father, Isaac, into thinking that he, Jacob, was the eldest son to Esau. And Isaac pronounced his blessing over who he thought was his eldest son, Esau, but in fact was the younger of the two boys, Jacob. Esau found out about this, was absolutely outraged. And now, you know, Jacob had crossed the line. You've done it now, bro. It's time to get you. And he was out to actually murder his brother. Well, the parents would not have any of that. And so what they did was they sent Jacob off to safety to a, a community down the way where his uncle Laban lived. And Uncle Laban um, would take care of him. And sure enough, that's what Jacob did. He sought some refuge there. When he got there, he met this young woman. Her name was Rachel. Turns out she was his cousin. And as Laban goes, or as Laban invites Jacob into his home to stay, Jacob explains to his uncle how he's, he's got the eye for, the, for daughter, Rachel. And they actually negotiate some marriage terms. In their day and in their culture, the whole cousin marriage thing was, was a fine thing for them. Sure enough, Jacob does the work, <clears throat> and Uncle Laban says, it's time to take my daughter, Rachel, as your wife. So there's a wedding, a big, big party. There must have been some sort of spirits flowing there. And I'm talking about liquid spirits here, such that at the conclusion of this wedding and the wedding night happens, and the next morning, Jacob wakes up and laying there beside him is not his bride, Rachel, but instead her older sister, Leah. Now, folks, I don't quite understand how that could happen, but that's how it happened. It sounds whew, pretty wild to me. You know, if you're tired of binge watching Netflix these days, pick up your Bible and start reading it. There's all kinds of stuff here. You can't make this up. That morning, he wakes up and discovers that, in fact, he has not married Rachel, his beloved, but instead he's gotten the older sister that he really had not paid much attention at all to. Jacob's upset, obviously. He goes back to his uncle. He says, hey, look, the deal was I was working for Rachel. And so Uncle Laban, again, initiates some terms, and sure enough, Jacob ends up taking Rachel for his wife as well. Again, in their day and in their culture, multiple wives was a thing that was accepted, and it was tradition. And so sure enough, now he has both sisters as his wives. However, Rachel was clearly the one that Jacob loved. Leah, not so much so. She was just in the way, just in the way. We're going to pick up on that story here and read a little bit more in Genesis chapter 29. And I invite you, if you have your Bibles, to please open them up and follow along. And I also invite you to read the whole story uh, later on today as it's, it's a good one and it's a powerful one. And I encourage you to read it. Genesis chapter 29, you'll see the scripture verses 
there on the screen before you, and you can just listen along as I read. But Genesis chapter 29, beginning with the 31st verse. And here we read. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened up her womb. But Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked on my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. She conceived again, and she bore a son, and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she named him Simeon. And again she conceived and bore a son and said, Now, this time, my husband will be joined to me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, he was named Levi. She conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she named him Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Leah, the unloved wife of Jacob. Notice her words. She said, God looked on her affliction. God understood. God saw the situation that she was in. And God gave her a son. And she says, and now, now my husband will love me. I've given him a son. Then she goes on to say, the Lord has heard that I am hated. He gets it. He knows. He understands. Now my husband will be joined to me. Now that God has given us another son, my husband and I will be like a real married couple. But not so much so. You see, Rachel and Leah, the two sisters, they were adversaries, very much like the two brothers, Jacob and Esau, were, were adversaries. Rachel was just so jealous of her sister that her sister was able to provide sons to her husband, and she could, could not. And so what Rachel did was she took her maid, her servant girl, if you will, and she took that, that maid and she gave the maid to her husband, Jacob, and she says, here, sleep with her, have babies through her. They will be ours, more or less. Well, Leah was not to be undone, and since she was unable to have children, it seemed, what she did was she did the same. She took her maid. She had one, too. She took her maid. She took that maid to Jacob and said, here, sleep with her, have children with her, and then we, too, will have more children together. Was I right about that Netflix thing or what? I mean, you just cannot even imagine all this carrying on taking place. Two sisters, the two maids, you name it. After a time, Rachel herself became pregnant. God opened her womb. God blessed her with a child, a son. They named him Joseph. And you know what? That sealed the deal. That did it. She played the trump card. She was clearly the favored wife to start with. And now that she herself had provided her husband a son, she would clearly take the reins of favored wife for all time. Leah would always be unloved by her husband. She would basically be just unimportant to him now. I mean, think about it. The situation is just totally unfair to Leah, isn't it? Just absolutely unfair. Her own father had done this deceiving and this trickery with Jacob to, to get Leah to be the wife instead of Rachel. Her own father treated her unfairly. And then her husband, her husband Jacob, I mean, he was unfair to her. I mean, he didn't mind sleeping with her. They had children together. She provided the sons that in their culture was, was so very important, but that still didn't matter. He still loved younger sister Rachel more. And then the sister herself, her own sister, treated her so badly. Poor Leah. Her, her situation, her life, it was just so unfair. But think with me for a moment. Who was the greatest king in Israel's history? King David. And who was the wisest man in all of Israel's history, some people would say he's the wisest man to have ever lived. 
That was David's son, King Solomon. Who was the man that actually raised Jesus Christ in his earthly life here? Joseph. Joseph and Mary, Bethlehem. He was the carpenter who actually held baby Jesus and raised him into manhood. And then, of course, the greatest of all, the Savior of our world, Jesus Christ. We're going to flip quickly to the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, the very first two verses of the New Testament. And there we read, On account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's how the whole New Testament begins. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Jesus, so often referred to as the son of David. He came from David's lineage. David had made such a name for himself and such a name for God and God's kingdom. And then Jesus comes from the lineage of David. Verse 2, Matthew 1, verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Abraham, father of Isaac, Isaac, father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. <laughs> you see, Rachel was, of course, Jacob's favored wife, but it was Leah, the unloved wife. She gave birth to Judah. Now, Judah, if you read about Judah, and I encourage you to do so, he was no saint, mind you. He's another different sort of Netflix episode to watch. But it was Judah through whom the lineage continued for generation after generation, such that David was born through Judah's line, Solomon was born through Judah's line, Joseph was born through Judah's line, and then Joseph raised Jesus Christ. You see, it was through Leah that Jesus Christ's lineage came to be. God got the last word in Leah's unfairness in her life. She would be the one to be known for providing the one through whom the lineage would lead us to Jesus Christ. Now, it was a long time from where she was to when Jesus Christ came, many, many generations, of course. But there were 12 sons, 12 sons that came from Jacob that became the 12 tribes of Israel. But it was the one son, Judah, Leah's son, through whom King David and Solomon and, and many, many others over the generations came to be, and ultimately right down to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So her life, despite the unfairness that she had to live through and endure, her life was significant because she bore Judah, one of the great, 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 great grandfathers of Joseph and ultimately the influence on Jesus Christ. God always has the last word in our unfairness, in yours and mine as well. Let's talk about that a little bit this morning. Now, I'm not talking about unfairness in the sense of minor things. Someone else has a nicer home or a newer car than you do, or someone else has better brand name clothing, perhaps, than you do, or you know, the latest electronic device or telephone. I'm not talking about those kinds of seemingly unfair things in life. I'm also not talking about those things where there's irresponsibility or negligence, maybe even stupidity involved in our part. Sometimes we do things that just show our lack of judgment, and the consequences of those things, we have to deal with those things. I'm not talking about that as unfair. What I'm talking about is when something is imposed upon you and or your family that is brought about through no fault whatsoever on your own, and your life is impacted and affected by those things. I mean, what did Leah ever do to anybody 
She just lived her life as, as other girls and women did in that day. She just took a husband as they all did and, and gave birth to children and raised them. She didn't do anything wrong. And, and I would ask the same question of you and even myself. What did you ever do to deserve or to initiate the kind of unfairness that you've had to experience? And I'm sure that you can think of something in your life that you have deemed to be just totally unfair. You know, unfairness in life kind of changes over time, doesn't it? When we're children, we think it's, uh, you know, it's an unfair thing that someone else has a, a nicer toy or our siblings get to play with the toys that we wanted to have. Or as teenagers, we, we think it's unfair that someone else took our desired date to the dance. But as we grow into adulthood, it gets a whole lot more serious, doesn't it? That's what we really want to talk about a little bit today. Sadly, though, we do see right in our own communities where some children are handed some adult unfairness through no fault of their own. They didn't do anything wrong, but maybe they lost their parents in some sort of accident or through some type of illness. Or maybe they have parents that have been um, have committed a crime and are in jail and they don't get to see them or they're you know, addicted to some type of substance that takes them away from being any sort of viable parent to their children. That's totally unfair and so wrong. My heart breaks for children in that situation. And you, 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 you beg and plead with God that, that it would somehow be made right. But think about your own life, maybe in your situation. Maybe you're in a, in a work situation where a coworker thought your idea was so great that they took it to the boss. And ultimately they got all the credit for something that you initiated. That's not fair. Or maybe someone else uh, in the workplace, in the office, got the, the promotion that everybody was looking toward and you really had the credentials and you'd put in the blood and sweat equity to get it. You had worked really, really hard, but for whatever sort of un understandable reason, someone else got that promotion instead. It's just unfair. It's just unfair. Perhaps you're one of those families where you've desired children and wanted children desperately in your family and, and just couldn't, for whatever reason, just couldn't. And yet we see others who really aren't longing for children, and yet they seem to be able to conceive right off the bat. And sadly, in so many cases, don't want those children, and in, often when they don't, will just commit the murder of abortion to undo what they consider a mistake that they've made. That's so unfair that those folks are able to conceive, but, but you're not. Maybe you're someone who has an illness, not through any sort of thing that you did to contract it. It just, just happened. Or maybe there's been a loss in your life of a of a sibling, a parent, a spouse that just, just feels so wrong and so unfair. Maybe it's a broken relationship where the one that you cared so deeply for, that you loved so very much, all of a sudden, out of the blue, seem to decide that this isn't for them anymore. They're just done and the relationship is gone. Maybe they just had some sort of senseless change of mind or heart and what you thought was, was a future suddenly is ended. It's unfair. You know, it's, another unfairness is, is what COVID-19 has taken from, from us. All of us have experienced its effects one way or the other. If you're one of those people who, who has been working harder and longer than ever before, maybe you're one of the, the healthcare workers who we cherish and love and thank you for all that you're doing for us or other kinds of workers that keep foods on our tables and and the the workings of our community still going as so many people are in isolation in these days we thank you for that maybe you're one that's that feels very stuck at home and felt feels like you know all of life has been kind of put on hold whatever the case may be it's unfair 
He didn't do anything. We hear a lot about uh, in our world today about uh, life opportunities and how some people are entitled and privileged and have just simply because of where they were born and the parents they were born into, they have all kinds of opportunities that others perhaps do not. Others have these seemingly impossible obstacles to get over and around. And it's just unfair. It's just unfair that some have it made, so to speak, and others hardly stand a chance. Again, you know what your unfairness is in your life. When you think about it, unfairness makes us feel insignificant, doesn't it? Look at Leah. She just felt kind of worthless. That, you know, her husband didn't love her. Her sister didn't love her. Her father, the, the, the stuff that he did, Leah just felt insignificant. Unfairness makes us feel unappreciated and sometimes just downright unnecessary. Unfairness in life will bring hurt and pain sometimes through people that <laughs> perhaps we thought loved us, but then we determine maybe not. And that's the, thus the unfairness. Unfairness makes us feel that our life somehow lacks meaning and lacks value. So what do we do? You know, what do we do when unfairness hits us from whatever source, whatever the, the details might be? Let me encourage you this morning, and, and I wrestle with this myself. Uh, let me encourage you to see God in it, to see God, to see God in the midst of the unfairness of your life. I know it's hard and it's difficult to get past some of the, the emotions and the anguish and even the despair that unfairness can kind of impose upon our lives. And that's just it. When it imposes upon us, as opposed to us initiating it or us prompting it through bad decisions, when it's just thrown on us, it's just so unfair and sometimes so hard to deal with. But let me encourage you, try, do your best to see God in it and to envision his grander purpose in you and in your unfairness. Because you know, you're a child of God and he loves you like no other. And regardless of what has been thrown upon you, God still uses your life and mine as we surrender ourselves to him and we beg and plead with him to do so. God uses our lives for his glory and to bring significance to his kingdom. You know, Leah, she knew God saw her. That's a beautiful thing. She was able to see God in the midst of this, this bad marriage that she was in. She knew God saw her and remembered her and blessed her. He blessed her with the gift of children. She knew that and she saw God's hand in that. Even if her husband didn't love her, God did and she knew it. And ultimately, Leah's life provided the legacy that led us right through to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and although she was not able to see that herself, God blessed her and God had the last word. We return to the story of Sister Helen Prejean and the her book, The Dead Man Walking. She tells the rest of the story after the execution. You see two families, two families that had this unfair, heinous loss at the hand of this evil young man. Those two families were just absolutely filled with hate because of the unfairness in their life. The young girl, the young teenage girl, her, her family, her dad especially, it was that hate that he actually harbored and held onto, and it somehow, in his mind, sort of got him through it all. He just hated still. The young teenage boy who was murdered, his dad, he too had some hate as well. But after a time, that dad, he got together with Sister Helen Prashan. The, the nun who had befriended the murderer and even attempted to get him off the hook of his sentence, the dad of the murdered boy began praying with Sister Helen Prashan. 
we're not told in the book, and I don't know kind of where all that ultimately went in that man's life and in that man's family. But God got the last word there. This man turned his heart toward God, at least in the means of praying with this woman who he clearly saw as a spiritual advisor, who someone who knew God, and he turned to God through her. God got the last word. Do you see God getting the last word in your unfairness today? I mean, let's go back to that, that workplace situation where there's some unfairness taking place there. It's just not right, and you know it's not right, and everything within you wants to just well up and scream and holler and make a case out of it and demand some sort of, of making it right. But maybe, maybe in the midst of all of that, there's a way for you to see through to what is it that God is doing. Maybe the person that, that got the credit for that stolen idea of yours or got that promotion that you clearly deserved, maybe there's a way that in the midst of that unfairness that you can help that person see that, you know, work accolades, career accolades, as wonderful as they are, they're not, they're not all. What's even better is a true and sincere personal relationship with God. Maybe there's some doors of opportunity that are opened there for you in your unfairness. I've seen those who have struggled <clears throat> having a family and gotten through the anguish and despair of not being able to have children, to foster children, to adopt children, to take on children that for whatever reason didn't have the opportunities uh, that so many do in fact have. And these parents who couldn't conceive on their own have provided these amazing God-honoring, God-loving, God-serving and worshiping homes for other young children that weren't going to have that opportunity. What a blessing it is to see God in that unfairness and to envision how he can make something special and amazing out of it. Illness and loss, they're hard, they're heartbreaking. But you know, I've, I've got someone very, very close to me that, that is enduring illness. I've got several in my family. And what I hear so often is, despite the illness, that the illness itself has, has opened doors. It is through the, the pain of the illness or the pain of the loss the difficulties that they have to endure on a daily basis, that God has opened up doors of opportunity to relate to other people who are starting to experience some of the same things, who may not have the solid foundation of Jesus Christ that they do. And so they're able to share with them and just to point them to Jesus. Maybe that, that person doesn't just jump right in and say, yes, let me give my heart and life to God, but they understand and know that there is a source, a person that they can turn to when life gets really hard and when their own unfairness mounts up to a point that they feel like they just can't take it anymore. They know who they can turn to and they know that they're going to get some solace and some compassion and some understanding there. God uses it. God uses the unfairness to help someone else. Broken relationships are hard. But maybe if you're one of those that is in one of those broken relationships, as, as difficult as it has been for you, just think about someone, perhaps someone younger or, or again, someone without the, the foundation of Christ, what they must experience as they go through it. And maybe they've got some other extenuating circumstances with financial difficulties or children or whatever else is taking place in that, that broken relationship. They need somebody to throw their arms around them and just to love on them and to say, I understand, what can we do to help? And, and maybe it's, it's practical means and ways of, of enlisting others to help this, this broken family. God can be and is in those difficult and unfair life circumstances and situations. And there's, there's some redemption and restoration in all of that as well. As we think about these days that we are all living through and this, this pandemic, there are those who are just so, so very frustrated, so anxious about all that's taking place to the point that it's just mental unhealthiness and anguish. We can love on them. 
we can help them. We can, can ensure them and point them towards Jesus Christ and, and maybe to the scripture itself, other uh, spiritual resources, pray with them. Love on them. Show them that God is here in the midst of it. And if you're one of those people, maybe then you too can find that in the midst of some of this downtime, that you can turn to God in the quiet and really find a depth of relationship you've not experienced with him before. Or maybe if you're one of those that is working like you've never worked before and you're just utterly exhausted, I hope and pray for you that you will see the reward of God's hand using you to care for and minister to others, whether it be in a medical situation or in just a very practical sort of day-to-day situation, that God is using you. God is taking your life and is impacting others through it. And you may not feel like it, and it may not seem so right at the time, but See God in the midst of it. Recognize that he is taking your unfairness and he is using it. We see so much injustice in our world today and there have been so much said and done and the protests and so forth that are in our news and in our daily lives on a, on a very daily basis. <clears throat> There's ways in which in that, that injustice, that unfairness, Change can be initiated. Change can happen. Change in circumstances and situations, but most important that we pray for change of hearts. There's so much being said and done and written and read and talked about and blogged and so forth about how we need to just come sit at the table together and listen and hear one another. And, and acknowledge and understand our differences and recognize that God put those differences there for a reason and that he uses them for his, his glory. God's got a grander purpose in the unfairness of our lives. God always has the last word. I ask God, and I hope you will too, God, what are you doing in me? What are you doing in me, God? in the difficulties and the unfairness that I'm experiencing in my life. God, what are you doing inside of me, molding and shaping and churning within me that is going to be used through me to help someone else that's going to walk down this road? Because someone else is always walking that road right behind us. How, God, how, God, in the midst of this when it hurts bad and when I just want to pull the covers over my head and cry, how is it, God, that you can take this unfairness and help me to help somebody else? I feel like I need someone to help me first, but God, you're there for me. How can I see you more clearly in it? And maybe, God, maybe I'm going to be like Leah and I won't see it all the way through to the very end. But that's, God, when you call me to trust you. And I do. I trust you that whatever it is that I'm experiencing in my life, whatever it is that that these and the sound of my voice are going through, the difficulties and the unfairness, I trust you, God, that you're using them. And I pray, God, that you will help me, help us to be the very presence of Jesus Christ to those who need him so, so desperately. Friends, recall the words of Jesus himself on the cross. He was praying to the Father, calling out to his heavenly Father. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they've done. Forgive them? Forgive? Forgive me? I so relate to the words of the Apostle Paul. In Romans chapter 7, when he said, oh, what a wretched man I am. I feel like that some days in my own heart and life. What a wretched man I am. I'm the one. My sin put Jesus Christ on that cross. I'm the one that drove the nails into his hands and feet. I am such 
the sinner. I am the one. I am the one that deserved that kind of painful, humiliating death. Not him. That wasn't fair to him. What was fair to me, what is fair to me, is to receive the very wrath of God. But instead, in his mercy, in his love, in his supreme goodness, he gave me undeserved grace. And he did the same for you, friends. He did the same for you. Yes, there's going to be unfairness in our life. Absolutely. There is unfairness in all of our lives right here today, right now. Will God make all that perfect for us here and now? No, no, not in this life. But here's his promise. He will make it purposeful. He will make our unfairness purposeful and use it for his glory to draw someone else to him. God always has the last word in our unfairness. Please, won't you pray with me this morning? God, we know that you are filled with goodness and mercy and such love for each and every one of us. How we treasure and cherish you in that love. Father, forgive us, forgive me for the ways and means and things that I've done and thought and said that dishonor you and that don't bring glory to your name. And instead, Lord God, help point those out to me Work within me to change those things. Change my heart, Lord God. Fill my spirit with yours such that I can become more and more, each and every day, more like your son, Jesus Christ. Father, when unfairness comes, instead of fighting it, help me to see through it, to accept it in ways that I recognize that it can bring honor and glory to you. If I just trust you in it and envision what it is that you're trying to do in it and in me and what it is that you're trying to make of me in and through it. And I pray, God, that, that, that despite and in and through the unfairness in all of our lives, that your name be exalted, that your name be lifted high, that other people, the watching world, those who are far from you, can look and see the unfairness in us, relate it to their own lives and recognize that whatever it is that we have, we know that's you, they don't yet. But when they see that we've got something, that they recognize they need it, and that you would open doors, God, open up opportunities for us to share our life, raw and real and challenging as it is, such that they will be drawn to you. God, I pray that wherever any of us are today, whatever stage of life, whatever experiences that we are trying to get through, however unfair it is, knowing that we didn't do anything to bring this upon ourselves. Father, I pray that you would just help us with our attitudes and our perspectives to just continue to see you in it and trust you in it and to surrender ourselves to you in it. And Lord God, may you be glorified. May you be glorified, we pray. Because we know, Lord God, that this is not all there is. That you've got so much more in store because you always get the last word. We thank you and praise you, our loving gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Yeah. 